see that uh, Professor Liz Elliott is, is already online and she's going to be our first speaker today. Uh, Liz is, is well known uh, for her contributions to Aboriginal children affected by FASD in remote Australia. And we've heard from Liz on a number of occasions over the years and been a very active participant and very welcome participant. Uh, she was the clinical and research lead in the Lillawan project, uh, Australia's first FASD prevalence study that involved identifying and preventing FASD and providing uh, equity of access to education and health services for affected children. Today, she's presenting on a new project that is aimed at improving the lives of adolescents in remote Indigenous communities. Um, the Biggest One Kid project um, is, is a new project. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Liz talk about it. So, uh, Liz, over to you. Thanks very much, Tom. And um, I, 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 this meeting is working very well. I attended yesterday, but it, I'm looking forward to being there in person. So I am going to present some information on the Biggest One Kid project, which is still in progress, on behalf of my colleagues, Emily Carter, Marmanji Hand, Emma Bear, Mudge Bedford, Jadena Davies, Shane Carter, and Sue Thomas from Fitzroy Crossing, and Tracy Sung and Lauren Rice, who's really leading this study um, from Sydney University. And it's on behalf of the Manamundakura Women's Resource Centre and the University of Sydney, and of course, the families and adolescents of the Fitzroy Valley. But before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Fitzroy Va Valley, the Bunaba Guniandi, Nikana, Wallamajari and Wonkajonka people. And also to acknowledge that I'm speaking from Walla Medical uh, land uh, of the Eora Nation in Sydney. Um, so what I want to do really is tell you a good news story, um, it, which is about community-led research that has changed the life trajectories for children and adolescents with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and early life trauma. And so I'm really going back to tell you a bit of the background. So where is Fitzroy Crossing? Well, it's a long way from Sydney. It's uh, about 6 a.m. there now, and they're expecting 43 degrees today. 36 very remote communities with predominantly Aboriginal people from five major language groups. They live in a tropical climate with an extreme lack of infrastructure. And there is, of course, has been a lot of historic trauma and is current disadvantage. And you can see here uh, the, the one of the only two hotels in Fitzroy Crossing, which is of course flooded for part of the year. And so we do need in remote communities to spend a lot of time camping. So just to go back, um, in 2006, the community was in crisis with alcohol-related harms, deaths, and suicides. And courageous women, June Oscar and Emily Carter, lobbied for alcohol restrictions to the takeaway of anything but low-strength alcohol. And this was documented in a film called Yajalara, or To Dream, by Melanie Hogan and Jane Latimer, which was shown at the UN. And when the women came back from the UN, they said, well, what are the... What are the problems that are faced by our children? Why are they struggling at school? Um, why do they look different? Why are they having health problems? Could this be related to alcohol use in pregnancy? So they developed the Marulu strategy, which in the Bunaba language means precious, worth nurturing, to address the diagnosis and prevention of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and provide support for families. And they invited the University of Sydney to come on board. So we did find indeed that there was a high prevalence of prenatal alcohol exposure, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and early life trauma. But the community decided that if they didn't have data, then there was no evident problem, they would get no action. And that research data would allow their community to take control. We had a high participation rate of all seven to nine year olds, 55% of them were exposed to high levels of alcohol in pregnancy, and one in five had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder with all its associated problems. Many of them, the majority, had early life trauma, and parents reported to us that their major difficulties, once the children were, were over their health problems, were challenging behaviours at home and at school. So that led us to introduce a community-modified triple B uh, or positive parenting program. Now the community called this Jandu Yani Yu for all 
families. And we trained up 40 local parent coaches to deliver this program to over 400 families and to over 500 community members. And in the result of this project, parents and family members said they felt increasing empowerment. They felt they had a voice both at home and in the community. And importantly, we were able to document decreased levels of depression, anxiety and stress in those family members. We were able to document that there were, was less negative parenting, laxness, overreactivity and hostility. And in, in consult with this, there was a decrease in problem behaviours that they reported and in pro, uh, uh, an increase in positive or pro-social behaviours. So this project had a lot of impacts, not only academic impacts such as publications and, and PhDs, but it resulted in the capacity to provide some response to what we'd found. And this came in, in part in three NHMRC projects, the ALERT project to address impulse in control in schools, the Jundur U project to help parents uh, with parenting, and I've just talked about that, and the Marud project, which is currently in project to develop and evaluate wraparound care, including telehealth for children in the community. We also know that there has been a decrease in alcohol use in pregnancy and an increased awareness of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And many children have had health uh, interventions and referrals. There's been education resources and support provided. And the community has used the data to get funding for the Bayagawi Early Childhood Centre, shown here, and to develop a Maralu team to support families. And they've also used these data to advocate for ongoing alcohol restrictions. Now, fortunately, we were able to put the data into a national inquiry, which eventually led to $20 million in funding nationally for FASD and a national alcohol strategy. And there's just been a second inquiry, a second strategy, and another tranche of funding. But the community was concerned that when these children were growing up, although some of them were doing well, as shown here, Tristan, who's got his own yard and maintenance business, some children were getting into trouble. Um, there was problems with stolen cars and trashing the school and some kids getting in problem with the police. They were also aware of the increased quest into deaths of young Kimberley people, which suggested that some of those children had uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And the Banksia Hill study in Perth, which showed that 36% of children in juvenile detention had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So they asked us, would we look at these kids from the Lillewan project 10 years later? And really our aim is to improve adolescent health and well-being, but we really want to give parents and youth a voice um, to describe what are their health, mental health and substance use challenges? What are their aspirations? How are they engaged in community? And importantly, what are their peer relationships and, and resilience like? We're linking their data to education, justice and child protection systems. And we're also using the data that we collected in the Little Little One project, prenatally in infancy and at seven to nine years to predict good and less good adolescent outcomes. And importantly, um, we're collecting data from youth using the ticket system, which is an iPad system, which they really like. It uses a lot of symbols uh, and it's validated for youth uh, for, for use in Aboriginal um, youth and also in people who have uh, intellectual cognitive challenges. So this is the team who's really doing all the hard work and I haven't been able to get up to Fitzroy Crossing since May of this year. So we have here Mudge, Nikita, Lauren and Emma. And uh, you can see here Emily Carter, the CEO of Manamundapura with myself and Sue Thomas, Gaydna Davies and Malmanji Hand. So what we're trying to do is, in the process of data collection, provide supports and think about what the long-term supports might be. And what we found is that the adolescents are saying to us that they have very high rates of early life trauma, depression and anxiety, PTSD. Many of them have had intention to harm. But conversely, many of them are resilient and hopeful for the future. And that's really what we've got to uh, help them achieve 
many of them have good peer, family and community connections. It's interesting to note that, of course, many of the parents have trauma and some of them have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. The young people tell us there's nothing to do in the community. They really want culturally appropriate mental health services. They don't know how to access services and they say the current services make them feel shame. There are no male counsellors or male social workers, so we're working on that. And they want youth workers to deal with the young people. And importantly, they want any therapy to be delivered as a group rather than as an individual and centred around cultural activities. It's also important to note that none of the children who had been diagnosed with disability had access to NDIS. And the team in Fitzroy has recently met with uh, Minister Reynolds to address that issue. So what are the intermediate supports that have been provided? Well, there have been positive youth activities. Mudge and Emma and Nikita and co are taking the kids on on-country trips. Uh, there have been women's nurture and pamper nights, art and music workshops, and what they're calling troopy therapy, which is when they find when they're taking uh, kids out to, to activities or to appointments, they open up and start to talk about their problems. There have been some whole of community healing camps. We've provided some baby brain training and some positive parenting to the adolescents because we found that 20% of these um, girls by the age of 17 to 19 have got their own children. Um, and importantly, and this is a really important thing that kids and youth can't get on unless they have practical supports. So our team is spending a lot of very valuable time getting these kids birth certificates, IDs, driver's licenses, bank cards and Medicare cards, signing them up to Centrelink or to seek employment, helping them apply for TAFE or uni or taking them to doctor's appointments and sexual health appointments. And the elders in the community have been participating in a suicide response training course. In the long term, of course, we want to provide culturally appropriate mental health services for youth. We want locally trained youth support workers to help kids engage in the community. Um, we want supported, we want to be able to support their education, vocational training and employment. And finally, a message for, from Emily Carter. She says, our research has taught us that education and support for FASD are needed across the lifespan, that adolescents need people to walk alongside them to navigate supports that they need to thrive as adults, that the model used in the Biggest One Kid Project will ensure that research is translated quickly into improved services and support, and that much can be achieved when communities take control of their destiny, prioritise and lead research, and form trusted partnerships and engage with government. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, uh, that, was, that was a great update. Now, do we have any, any questions? That came there from? is um, one question from Kathy Rashogi. So um, I think it was answered just towards the end there, but um, Kathy asks, are there any elders in the communities, Liz? And she says, I might be off the mark, but would it be useful to engage elders and wrap culture and belonging around kids instead of conceptualising them as sick, needing intervention? Um, and I did note that, um, Liz, you mentioned that the um, elders themselves are undertaking suicide. Um, well, well, just to go back a bit, I mean, this is all led by the elders. We have spent, we spent over a year in consultation across these 36 remote communities. Uh, we have an advisory group which is entirely made of Aboriginal elders and we have um, youth groups and um, all the Aboriginal controlled organisations that are involved in this project. So it's entirely led by them. And in fact, when they do the on-country activities, that is an intergenerational thing. So there might be four generations um, out on these on-country on activities telling stories helping catch kangaroos, cooking the, the meals, making damper, um, helping kids learn how to hunt or fish. So it's very much embedded in the community um, as, as have all these projects been. And I think the last point I made is that no research can be done with Aboriginal communities unless 
the research is prioritised by them, it's going to give them some immediate benefits um, and it can be led by them uh, all along the way. Thank you. Um, 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 one more question is just um, from Isabel O'Keefe. Um, she missed the name of the validated tool that you said you were collecting data on iPads with um, and just wondering if it was available for use. Yes, look, there are about 20 different tools that, that are used within that. Um, I'm very happy if she sends me an email to send her a copy of our protocol. Um, what we've tried to use is, one, we've used validated tools, but we've wanted to use tools that have been used previously in our original communities and are acceptable to the community. So they've all been passed by our elders and advisory groups and that they're meaningful. So they're using language that people can understand. Um, and of course, as you would know, many of the tools that are used in the general population are less suitable for a different cultural context. Yeah. Um, one more question. It says, it's been many years since I've been in Fitzroy. There, um, there was a long-term on-country program for males. Does this still run? Yes, look, this is, I, I don't know whether you're talking um, about a project run by the CALAC, the Kimberley Aboriginal Land Council. Um, and one of the problems with a lot of these projects and community-led projects is that the funding is very short-term. So there's this sort of three-year cycle of funding. And um, I know that one of those programs for young males had lost its funding. And so that's one of the things that Emily Carter is advocating for at the moment is funding for on-country activities, not only for men, uh, but for young women. Um, and they, of course, are run by the, the, the local elders in the various language groups.